We are in a revolution. But it is a revolution in which the side that fires the first shot loses. We will not fire any shots because our weapon is uncommon good sense. Hello and welcome to Tractor Time. Tractor Time is brought to you by Barn to Door and Acres USA, the voice of eco agriculture. I'm your host, Ben Trollinger, editor of Acres USA magazine. On this episode, we're discussing talking plants and smart insects with entomologist and author, Dr. Joe Lewis. Lewis spent his career in entomology with the USDA Agricultural Research Service at the Tifton campus of the University of Georgia. It was there that he worked to unlock the secrets of how plants and insects communicate with one another, particularly how plants use SOS signals to recruit beneficial insects to their defense. Based on those groundbreaking insights, Lewis and his colleagues developed holistic and sustainable approaches to pest management within agricultural systems. Based on those groundbreaking insights, Lewis and his colleagues developed holistic and sustainable approaches to pest management within farming systems. In 2008, along with his colleagues John A. Pickett and James H. Tumlinson, Lewis received the prestigious Wolf Prize in Agriculture. Although Lewis has published papers in many academic and scientific journals, he's just published his first book for Acres USA. It's called A New Farm Language, How a Sharecropper's Son Discovered a World of Talking Plants, Smart Insects, and Natural Solutions. The book is part memoir and part agricultural treatise. It's a valedictory statement on a lifetime of scientific achievement, as well as a testament to his enduring curiosity about the natural world. A curiosity that began on a small family farm in Mississippi. I'm thrilled to share this interview with you today, but before that, we're going to check in with the fine folks at the Rodale Institute. Welcome to a monthly segment we're calling Transition Land. It's a collaboration with the Rodale Institute, and we're focusing on helping conventional farmers transition to regenerative organic practices. On this episode, Christy Wendelberger joins us to go deeper into the soil nourishing benefits of cover crops. Welcome back, Christy. Hi, Ben. Thank you. Over the last several months, we've talked about cover crops and their manifold benefits. They feed the biology in the soil. They help build soil structure. You can use them to mitigate unwanted pests like nematodes. Today, we're going to talk about cover crops as a biofumigant. And first off, I think I should ask, what is a biofumigant and why should farmers care about that? Well, biofumigants are plants that create chemicals that when they're broken, when the plant material is broken down, these chemicals will become volatile and go into the soil and they'll kill fungal bacterial fungal um, diseases and other they also can kill nematodes as well and and other diseases that you can get on your cash crop and so a farmer can use it as a cover crop before planting their cash crop to help eliminate some diseases they may have a problem with some pathogens they have some problems with in the field and is there a particular kind of cover crop that is most effective as a biofumigant? Plants within the Brassicaceae family tend to be the ones that people use the most. Um, sorghum is also another type of cover crop that people use, but often it's the Brassicaceae. So your mustards, your cauliflowers, your broccoli, those are all within the Brassicaceae family. Often there are mustard plants that are used and you grow them in this nice, beautiful field of yellow flowery mustards and then chop them up and get, get your biofumigant. So what are the chemical compounds that are making these effective at sort of bringing uh, a field or ecosystem into balance? So the plants themselves produce glucosinolates those materials are created in the plant itself. And then as the plant's growing, they bring in sulfur. These, what they call them, the, the glucosinolates are called GSLs for short. Um, it's easier to say. And when these GSLs bring sulfur up from the ground, so that's important to know that when you're growing these cover crops, they do need sulfur for to be fertilized with sulfur to make sure there's plenty of sulfur available for them. And then once they're, the plant is broken down and their cells are broken apart as much as possible, then they, they will mix with a natural enzyme in the soil that's called myrosinase. 
And that enzyme plus water, plus that chopping mechanism and the GSLs all come together and make isothiocyanates. And that's the gas, the isothiocyanate is the gas that is released. And then that's what kills these pathogens. Well, what are the tricks for making these kinds of cover crops as effective as they can be? I mean, how can you ensure that you're handling them properly in order to get the sort of maximum effect as a biofumigant? Well, it will depend on the time of year that you're planting, but mostly they find whether you cut your cover crops in the summer or the winter or when you put this cover crop in, mostly what they find is uh, scientists have found that if your crop gets to about 25% flower, once it's there, then it is kind of at its max peak in these GSLs. And so at that point, that's when you would flail mow it and leave it, leave it down on the ground. And a lot of times people will follow that immediately with another person on a tractor behind them and disc the soil into the ground. So, or disc that, that flailed material into the ground so that all that residue can get incorporated into the soil right away. Cause the moment Within 15 minutes, you can lose 80% of those volatile gases that you need for your for biofumigation. And is this a widespread technique that is being used? This has been around for over 30 years. People have been doing this for a long time. Um, but of course, you know, it synthetic, synthetic fungicides and synthetic chemicals come along and it just seems easier to do, right? Because you can do that right before you put your plants in. You can, it, it just feels cleaner to put this medication down on the soil, right? Where with these cover crops, you have to spend extra time. You have to grow the cover crop and you have to treat it like, like a cash crop. You might have to fertilize it a little bit and give it water and make sure that it is growing well so that you get a nice, rich biomass out of it. But yeah, for over 30 years, people have been doing this and as, as these chemical fun, fungicides have been showing to be bad for human health and bad for the environment, we're starting to kind of move back into that, into trying to figure out ways of doing it differently. So they do it in Australia. They use this in, in techniques in Australia, throughout Europe, throughout the U.S. Rodale is working on an experiment looking at bio um, uh, biofumigants for pig parasite removal within the soil strata. So it's uh, it's it's becoming more and more common. What about cost? Is it cheaper to use cover crops as a biofumigant as opposed to synthetic fumigants? Well, so in the short run, it might not feel cheaper because it probably is a little bit more expensive for the seed. And then the time that you're away from the field, you have to have a few, you know, several weeks, six, six eight, 12 weeks for that plant to grow, depending on your season and your, your weather conditions. And so that's time away from having a crop. And then once you incorporate it, you have to wait two weeks because you don't want that biofumigant to impact your cover crop and what's what you put in or your cash crop that you're putting in afterwards. So up front, it might feel like it's more money, but in the long run, if you're managing your soil properly, it's also adding carbon and doing all of the things that a cover crop will do, fixing, making your soil healthier, giving you more aeration, giving you more better infiltration, helping work with the microbial community, your, your, just the microorganisms within the soil. So it's doing all of that on top of the fact that it is acting as a biofumigant. So you're in the long run, building better soil, making it so you have less pathogens in your soil and making it so you have to, over the long term, put less pathogen, less chemicals onto your property. So, you know, in the, the idea is eventually you wouldn't have to use chemicals on your property because there, you would be doing this the natural way. Well, Christy, thanks so much for joining us today. It's always great to be here. Christy Wendelberger is the research director for the Rodale Institute Southeast Organic Center in Chattahoochee Hills, Georgia. She's responsible for expanding organic farming practices throughout the Southeast through research, outreach, and education. Learn more about the Rodale Institute at rodaleinstitute.org. 
I want to take this moment to introduce our sponsor, Barn to Door. They're doing a new segment aimed at helping farmers, and you'll hear that later in this episode. But who are they? Barn to Door powers farmers who sell direct, helping them increase sales, access customers, and save time. They help farmers meet buyers' expectations through easy ordering and an accessible brand across online channels. Farmers use software, services, and resources from Barn to Door to manage and promote their business. The bottom line is this. Farms that provide convenient buying and delivery options reach more buyers. Data show farmers can double revenue when they offer online subscriptions and direct delivery. Promote your brand, manage your orders, and keep your profits with Barn to Door, providing the capabilities and support you need to build a thriving farm direct business. Learn more at barntodoor.com forward slash tractor time. A New Farm Language tells the story of Joe Lewis's humble beginnings as the son of an illiterate Mississippi sharecropper and the hard scrabble yet happy childhood he spent raising chickens and growing cotton. It was on that small rented farm, which had no electricity or indoor plumbing, that Lewis developed a fondness for nature that would set him on an unlikely path toward becoming an eminent scientist and innovator. More than a memoir, A New Farm Language is a manifesto and mission statement confronting the abuses of industrial agriculture and defending the value of strong communities and natural solutions. Without any further ado, here's my conversation with Dr. Joe Lewis. Joe, welcome to the podcast. Yes, thank you, Ben. You were born and raised in rural Mississippi, and your family mainly grew cotton but it wasn't necessarily much like the large monoculture operations we see today. Describe the kind of environment as well as the time period you grew up in. Our cash crop was cotton. We did grow other crops. In fact, that I think is pretty important to our discussion here. But I think what led to you make that comment is the fact that our, what we re- relied on primarily for our use of or making of any cash for business this transaction that ran our uh, operation was five acre of cotton uh, we grew corn we had vegetables uh, in our garden we had chickens and livestock and so forth but our yes it was typical for the southern states and the southern belt of agriculture at that time cotton was the cash crop and how well we did in a year as far as being able to uh, have anything to spend was on cotton. In fact, one of the things that I think that was very important as part of the overall description, indeed, it was a very rural area uh, in southwest corner of Mississippi, about, uh, probably about 65, 70 miles north of uh, Baton Rouge in that corner of Mississippi. It was a very rural area with just uh, mostly small family farms that you just farm for subsistence. And what drove everything was the cotton is cash crop. And we grew all our food uh, primarily. We had the smokehouse uh, uh, and canned vegetables and we had chickens that were free range. I didn't know anything but free range chickens. And when you would go along on these these back roads of that community, there were just a lot of little small family farms. And what was interesting, we had no bank account or anything. Everything was just sort of handled by cash. There's no such thing as writing a check. And we were sharecroppers. My father was uh, illiterate, could not read or write a single word. And it was truly a really rural life deep into the backwoods of South Mississippi. Though it was a rugged life, from a standpoint of uh, richness of nature, it was a wonderful environment. And you, for a kid with a robust curiosity, which I had, it was a really a haven of adventure and uh, uh, just uh, was quite fortunate and I feel now because we were embedded in nature and what uh, further was our case we had no running water no electricity we were driven by the power of nature so we had to develop our cycle of the day and operate based on daylight 
And so we understood and related to nature based on ourselves being a part of nature. And we, there was no uh, commercial tainting of the sounds and other activities. It was a, a full absence of commercial. So we truly related to nature in the truest sense. And I, I think that's one of the things uh, because of that interwoven level of everything being uh, of chickens and cattle and crops, we really uh, uh, developed an understanding of the fact that nature was a truly a system of interactions. This was your, your father, your mother, yourself, and your, your sister. When was this? Well, I was born in 1942. Okay. Uh, it was right at the end of the Great Depression and at the early phases of World War II. At that time, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution impact on agriculture was beginning to occur, though we didn't experience it there in that specific area for probably another 10 years. And I'm curious to know, what was it about that time and place and environment that led you ultimately to become a scientist, specifically one who studies insects. I think this might be a good time to walk us through your academic career. As I was saying, I became quite intrigued with the exploring of nature uh, because I think that really impacted me, the fact that we really saw and appreciated the fact that in a true diverse a nature environment where you, you know, as you go on and later develop, there was the heavy monoculture development, large fields planted from ditch bank to ditch bank and no true ecotones. I, I really experienced ecotones where the richness of nature was. And, and, and because of that, the greatest, uh, I guess, the power of interactions was at the interactive uh, intersections between, you know, uh, pasture land and a uh, forest. Also, this uh, plant interacting with an insect. All it was at these interactive points that you could see the richness. As we become more reductionist and later moved heavy to monocultures and this type of thing. You didn't see this richness and the level of our behavioral interactions that I really experienced. And so I, I do think what was different about it is I developed a, a seeing nature on the terms of nature itself. And I learned to see very much as I went on later into science that when you take an in set or any other animal or plant out of this context of interaction, you're not seeing them on their term. You, you are seeing them on your term. And you just don't see the same interaction. So I'm saying that to point out that I think that I was stimulated to really enjoy and appreciate the power within nature and how we are a part of that. And of course, later as I went on, I, I, even though we had a very small rural school, I think I had good teachers in life sciences and other things, and, and specifically uh, a biology teacher in high school who was also, also my coach. And these interactions of people encouraged me, and I developed a real interest in life sciences. And, I uh, did eventually go on into college and get into biology itself. But these experiences at the edge of fields and in the, in the backwoods of nature itself is where I began to love to study and observe the interactions. And, and then you went on to have this academic career that, that focused on a very specific sort of slice of what would you call it? I, I think you're getting at the fact that you're, I began to be quite specific in the area of biological control and the study of parasitic predaceous insects, particularly the aspect of chemical ecology. So it was somewhat specialized, but we really studied it and became specialized in that area. I always conducted those studies in the context of the greater whole. 
And I think a lot of our work is later on, uh, and we can talk about this as you want to move into it, working with a, a chemist friend, uh, Jim Tomlinson, and putting together a team. We appreciated the value at that time of not just taking, say, a particular species of parasitic wasp or other natural enemy and developing a colony in the lab and studying that individual, we looked at the importance of that individual as a part of a system. And this is uh, to step back a little to the discussion later, uh, I think what was most important in our study is we did uh, value the fact that, you know, the world is made up of systems within systems. And I went on to that to be the strong motivating force of a lot of my studies was the fact that, that we're made up of systems within systems and the power is within that natural system. In fact, if you take a parasitic wasp that's operating in the field, we learn the moment that you unplug that individual from its natural context and started a colony or even just held that insect apart, from its natural uh, environment, you are, have a different individual. And I think that's the point you were getting at, and you can ask me to clarify if you feel uh, a need to, but. Yeah, this, this might be a good time for you to give us a synopsis of your work studying plant and insect communication. I think the idea that plants could, or can send out signals into the environment that influence other creatures at the time seemed like a really radical idea. It requires a lot of rethinking in a way of how we view and interact with the natural world. So I'm, here, I'm curious to hear more about that. I mean, I think this is definitely compressing decades of scientific study in, into you know kind of a small space, but this idea about this plant insect communication pathway, I, this was a, a pretty major breakthrough. Yes, it, it, it was quite remarkable and you know, as I was saying, even from the earliest studies of parasitic insects and wasps, and, and just to clarify a little bit to put so anyone in the audience that doesn't understand the, uh, the context of what we're talking about, you have, you know, all animals have parasites that have parasites or have predators that have predators. And when you have plant feeding insects like uh, a boll weevil or a boll worm or an army worm that's feeding on the plant, they have natural enemies that attack them. And it's made up of two primary types of insect feeding insects. That is the predators, things like the uh, lady beetles and lace wings that attack. And to them, this caterpillar, or, uh, instead of feeding on plants, they feed on other insects and you have the predator group. And then you have the parasitic group that like the little parasitic wasp that were a primary target of our study is a little wasp that goes around and instead of feeding on the plant, their young develops inside some host insect. And what they do is the female adult of this parasitic wasp deposits an egg on or within a caterpillar and that egg hatches into a little worm and the big worm, and it's a parasitic insect. And eventually it's kind of like an alien. It feeds inside this caterpillar and eventually eats its way out, kills the caterpillar host, and spins a cocoon and emerges into an adult, and the cycle continues. You have males and females, and they mate, and the female wasp goes about attacking other caterpillars. These insects are very important natural enemies to help the farmer or protect the plant from being overly attacked by these caterpillars. They're part of the balance of nature. Now, given that context, uh, our study was about how do these little parasitic wasps possibly find a caterpillar feeding in a huge field? And we knew they were important biological control agents. And this had is known for years and years. But there, you know, there's been years where 
we kind of had the paradigm that all animals of in the invertebrate groups like insects do things by instinct and your only vertebrates learn. Well, we know one thing in, in studying how do these little parasitic wasps attack the caterpillar host and find them and locate them, they learn. And so we did quite a bit of studies around this. And when we first demonstrated that these little parasitic wasps can indeed learn, and I'll explain it in a few minutes in more detail, it, it's no different than, uh, it's true associative learning, just like training a dog to go pick up the morning paper and bring it to you. So we demonstrated the learning. And then the other thing, the, we found that the plant played a very active role. And that in fact, when you have the caterpillar feeding on them, we worked out the system, uh, primarily my team working with Jim Tomlinson, who did the chemistry part, we did the behavior. We discovered that when the caterpillar, something like a boll worm or an army worm is feeding on something like a cotton plant, the plant actually has sensory mechanisms on its surface that they recognize when they uh, when this caterpillar begins munching on it, that they're under attack. And they begin to crank up a set of chemical factories and emit body odors. It's like an SOS signal, a cry for help, so to speak, to recruit the good guy to come attack this caterpillar, which is a mutualistic interaction between the plant and the parasitic wasp. And it's quite remarkable that, it, and they could learn more and more as the fact that kind of what that smell was, get it in more detail and they improve their efficiency. So it's a combination of chemical signals and learning. And in fact, uh, it just, it completely changed the way we looked at natural enemies working and doing their job. Prior to those discoveries, we knew that things like plants help protect themselves by producing some chemicals uh, that were called like secondary compounds that were kind of nasty chemicals. And they produced these things like a tobacco plant that had, has a lot of secondary alkaloids and so forth that prevent the caterpillars and other things from feeding on them so heavy. But it was unknown the level that which plants actually produced in induced chemical odors to specifically function to recruit. And, and, and it only occurred when the damage occurred. And it was very important that it's this way because if they were producing these signals all the time, it would be confusing. But with the fact that they produce them only in response to the activity the feeding activity of the caterpillar, this allowed it to be them to only fly to those plants that needed their help. And it helps prevent, you know, resistance or it, it, it's an ability to work together. But you can see that to find that a plant's not just a shrinking balance sitting here, that it can actually emit a a body odor in response to an attack by a caterpillar uh, was quite remarkable and created a tremendous uh, uh, response throughout the world. A lot of people are working on this now, but it was an incredible finding to find both that the parasitic wasp is very plastic, its ability to learn, plus this cooperative interaction between the plant. It indeed move further to teach us that these, even a cotton field is a system of interaction. It's a tightly woven interactive, just like a big macroorganism, the soil and the plant and the herbivore and the natural enemies are all going through moves and counter moves and chemical signals and so forth. And it was, it's truly an interactive process of so nature has a powerful ability to maintain a balance of nature. And I, I guess a lot of the thoughts about use of parasitic insects prior to that time was more 
simplistic. These are little organisms that just work on instinct. One does one thing at a certain level, and if you put 10 or 100, they'll do 10 or 100 times that amount. So it, a lot of the thought was more about using them like a biopesticide. And this helped cause us to shift more to the idea, if you're getting a pest outbreak, something in that system is out of balance. What is it? How can we, why is, is this pest becoming a pest? And it moved us to a completely different type of thinking. Well, this might be a good time to explain why this particular insight and, and insights connected to this insight won the Wolf Prize for Agriculture. I mean, at first blush, you, you know, you're opening the door on this very noisy world of plant and insect communication, but put it into an agricultural context for us. As I was saying very early, we were, were learning, you got to study nature on its terms and its, its way of interaction. And this taught us that there is a tremendous power within the system. And we had operated for years, since, particularly since the discovery of things like DDT, more on an interventionist kind of paradigm. And that is, if you got a problem, fix it with some input. If you've got some pest outbreak that's occurring, use a pesticide and wipe them out. If you've got uh, uh, some plant that's not growing, maybe the nutrients not in balance, put a pesticide out. This type of input system that man, this was part of our whole line of thinking that had moved so strongly with the development of the industrial revolution to with the powerful use of tractors and the discoveries of all kinds of agricultural chemicals, you can intervene and fix things with the man's input and intervention into the system. What this did was say, look, no, it is a complex system. And the power was within the system. And if you intervene, you actually create disruptions in this interaction that's taking place. So rather than thinking about all about an interventionist system, we had to realize that we got to think more about what's going wrong. If you're getting a something that's not operating right within the production of cotton or corn or some other aspect of agriculture, you need to think, our greatest tool is within that system. What, how do we adjust that? Let me use the parallel of medicine, which I, uh, I think helps us to see this in easier term. If you're having uh, some uh, health problem, like let's say a reoccurring infection, even though the discovery of penicillin and the whole string of antibiotics were important <laughs> and brought about an interventionist paradigm, just like the pesticide intervention in agriculture. The concept was if you've got this undesired variable occurring, you use an input and treat it. So our idea was to use a pesticide or fertilizer to fix this problem. It, you, we saw that as the first team. What these discoveries, seeing how powerful the system is, we begin to recognize there are, nature has a way of handling this, it's built in. And if you will understand that system, you operate by maintaining a healthy design of that system. And, and anything you do uh, as an external intervention should only be short-term as a temporary fix why you get the natural system back into balance. So that's moves and help promote the power of the sustainable agriculture movement. And that's basically what the Wolf Prize was for us, was it said that our discoveries had helped advance sustainable agriculture. Did that make sense? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We're going to hit pause on this interview for a brief segment from our sponsor, Barn to Door. Hey, this is Sebastian from Barn to Door. 
For this week's Farmer Spotlight, we have Tom Bennett from Bennett Farms in Edwardsburg, Michigan. Barn to Door and Acres USA has partnered to create the Farm Innovator Series, where we invited Tom to share how his farm doubled year over year. Tom covered many tactics like growing his email list, offering deliveries, and how he gave his farm the competitive edge by offering subscriptions to his local community. I've had customers come to me at the farmer's market. And they're like, oh, we really love your stuff. This is awesome setup. It's great. But we ordered from ButcherBox and we really like it that they deliver to our door. I'm like, you should go to my website. I hand them my flyer and now they're a subscription customer the next day. So you can convert a lot of those customers because some of those brands have done a good job on subscriptions as far as like getting customers used to that idea of getting meat in the mail or delivered to their door. So capitalize on that because we do the same thing as them, except it's more local and more personal. If you're a farm out there that's like looking to get into direct to consumer, there's no way that you could, in my opinion, make this work without being online in one way or another, like selling online. It's the leading edge of what's happening right now, like in direct to consumer. I mean, you could be, you know, inside getting ready to go to bed. And like last night, we got an order at 1230 in the morning, and, you know, in the middle of the night, people are still buying stuff. It, it doesn't close. It doesn't have any overhead. I mean, we spend less on our barn to door subscription per year than we spend at one farmer's market, substantially less. If you want to hear more of Tom's tactics, you can go to barntodoor.com slash resources, or you can find it on the Direct Farm podcast where we have an audio version wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening. Well, I'm interested in, in hearing more about sort of the practical applications after you and your colleagues made this discovery. Did you then start over the years working with farmers and, and sort of Im- improving operations through these sort of biological insights? Yes, we moved along two paths. We were seeing that we had indeed, as I had just discussed, come down this road of interventionist movement so strong that it was really kind of hard to make that shift. And because that's just the way thinking took play. And it's no different than it's in medicine to really encourage people to think about promoting natural built-in approaches to maintaining health through using your built-in mechanism. The same thing was, had occurred in agriculture. So we had developed a, a, quite a bit of our time. In fact, we had just published a paper in proceeding to the National Academy of Science, pointing out this fact that we've got to make this shift to a total systems approach, which is, first of all, focus on your balance. And yes, we do need things like pesticides have been a wonderful tool. Fertilizers have been a wonderful tool, but they are the second team. So we were moving in different ways to promote that shift in thinking. But then we realized that we had to actually do some work with farmers and actual demonstrations and other things to to advance this. And so we did a lot of work uh, then in the 90s and so forth uh, throughout Georgia in with our work, uh, uh, working with farmers to do basically two things that occurred. People primarily were just clean tilling fields. Uh, I would call that the intervention of the plow, the way you control. Uh, they just say, you, if you have a field of cotton or corn, you don't want anything in there but corn or cotton. And you just maintain weed control and all the other things just by keeping clean tillage. And so as soon as harvesting was done, people would go in and clean the field and, and maintain clean tillage until they plant it next spring. And essentially in a field, all you planted was the crop. What we were seeing and showing from this systems approach is that you really, when you do that, you are losing your agroecology in the balance of nature because you, you really, when you do, you just create a lush environment for things that attack that plant. So we moved to, and also it was unhealthy for the soil. We were taking all the residue out and we're creating moisture problems. And, and so there were two arms of this 
approach. One was you needed a year-round perennial system by having cover crops and less plowing, strip till so that you main and built up residue and other things. And also you maintain a cycle of natural enemy pest balances and this more complex environment was just a healthier system. And then the other thing was then to understand which cover crops to put in, what other associated plants, so that you built a good balance of natural enemy pest relationships. So this was the push to move and redirect more to building a healthy system and maintaining it versus promoting pest management and quality products from the agriculture through promoting healthy system, which is the essence of the agroecology approach. And that is the way, a different kind of thinking, because even, even with the Rachel Carson movement and the follow-up uh, understanding and appreciation of the fact that you need to make use of natural enemies and so forth. There was a tendency to even think about the best use of a biological control agent like these parasitic wasps and predators and other things was to use them like a biopesticide, mass rear them and release them rather than promote the natural system built in. I'm glad you brought up Rachel Carson and, and her book, Silent Spring, which is just a, you know, a seminal work. And th- that word silent, that, that really stuck out to me because the, the whole time you were talking, I was thinking about how these ecological sort of farms, agricultural systems that you're talking about must be really sort of noisy places with lots of insects, lots of whirring and buzzing. And, you know, I'm curious to know more about sort of the threats that are out there now. I mean, are you uh, alarmed or concerned about the future of insects? Oh, yes, I am. I think it's a, the things that we're seeing from time to time regarding um, you know, reductions in the number and extension, extinctions of certain insect populations and even the bee decline, honeybee decline and other things, because as a part of this whole trend that has taken place from the way I grew up, which was really, uh, that's what's interesting about my life. I I experienced the true small family diversified farm uh, as sharecroppers on us, you know, small uh, subsistence farming to this large scale monoculture. The trends that have taken place as a part of this industrial revolution that we speak about in the book, and because we uh, we take it on into the human, I uh, guess, ecosystem too. But what's we have had this powerful movements of centralization and specialization. Uh, science and the industrial revolution has taken us to the reductionist approach, which means that we tend to just even in the South and have huge fields of cotton, corn, even if you practice year round cover crop systems, it's still a production of large specialized productions of cotton and corn or peanuts and other crops. Uh, and you move to the Midwest, it's wheat and so forth. We reduce the number of crops that we produce in, in large monoculture directions. And in also centralizing things with our urbanization movement and packing and butchering and distribution of food. <laughs> These centralization, specialization directions have taken our rural communities and really moved them away from diverse systems. You, you, may, you can go all around my area in South Georgia and you see, uh, you may see a very little animal production and feel you have big farms that's producing primarily peanuts, corn, and cotton. Uh, maybe very little in poultry and beef and cattle. And then you go to another area and there may be a lot of poultry production and big facilities and dairy centers. 
all these are more centralized in different parts of the country. So you see, we're differentiating, specializing, and that, that process is very hard on population, diverse population of everything from insects to plants. We're, we are really playing hardball with our diversity of nature. So it's not just the practice of interventionist pest management or crop production, it's our general trends of reductionism in, in the specialization, centralization, interventionist paradigm, all put together that is threatening our diversity of animals and plants. Well, do you see hope on the horizon? Are there examples that stand out to you as, as giving you a sense of optimism about the future? I'm a believer in holding on to hope and uh, look, and I think there is, uh, even though I state, uh, and it's one of the strong statements that, that, hey, we're losing our connection to nature. And I'm going to stop just a second and go back because I want to make this point very strong. That's the thing that I point out in the very earliest chapters of the uh, of, of this book is that in these environments like I grew up in, we understood our connection to nature. We were understood that we were not just connected, but we were of nature and a part of it. And you could, even through the sounds that you hear by the day, you could tell the time of day and you could tell if there was a storm developing and other thing. We heard the sounds of nature and we communicated with nature and understood the language of nature. As we have developed into all these patterns that we've talked about, like the uh, urbanization, centralization, of, and specialization, you have many people. Well, in fact, Richard Love, who has wrote a book on the uh, last child in the woods, points out that your average child now spends less, I believe it's something like four minutes in touch with nature in over six hours on electronic media. We're, we're losing our interaction and our appreciation of connection to nature and the way we're dis developing our landscapes. But I still see that it's built in. People have an appreciation for nature when they see it, but we've got to be more activists in this. Uh, and there, we have a lot of people, and you uh, see it yourself, Ben, and that there are pioneers and there are pockets of folks working together that understand this concern and are doing things to promote sustainable, regenerative agriculture. Those movements are taking place. They give me hope. The sense of people when they hear it and they, they recognize it, and it's sort of still built into the fabric of who we are, but the hour's getting late. We, we need to be much more proactive in this area. And I think we still can turn this around, but it's of concern. It's, uh, we have lost our practice at the level that we have, and I think we've all got to take a much more active role in it because uh, I think it's, it's, very, it's our greatest risk. Just a reminder to our listeners, uh, the title of Joe's book is A New Farm Language, How a Sharecropper's Son Discovered a World of Talking Plants, Smart Insects, and Natural Solutions. I'm curious to know more about the motivation behind writing the book. What audience were you hoping to connect with and what do you want them to take away ultimately? Because I should remind listeners, we haven't talked too much about this. The book is part memoir, sort of part science book, part agriculture book. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, a lot of different things. Maybe take this opportunity to describe sort of the impetus behind the book. Because I think I'm one of the maybe last people that really have the spectrum of life that I have, just because of the fact that I went into science and grew up the way I did, I have about as broad a role of experience. So I could write in terms of actual, from a biographical type of, of writing, 
care of people from the very early uh, stages of my life where we were practicing true nature-based living and agriculture that was at the nature of the way I grew up, which was with the mule and the small twos and, and diverse subsistence farming. You know, how many more, I don't know of anyone now that lives in the U.S. except just a few families maybe that just choose to live that way where you sit around the table and everybody at the table took place and growing the food and producing it and live as a family unit producing their own food. But that the flavor of growing up that way, seeing that type of living and then caring all the way, being a part of the issues that we're advocating uh, for and against in, in actual being in the field of science. So I went from the very simplistic life to the front end of modern technology. And people who knew that story had urged me to write it because through writing my life story, I could carry the audience through the experience of what has been taking place and the impact that's having on our society. So I wrote it, both those who are interested in sustainable agriculture and, and these issues, but a lot of people just want to read about the flavor of what life was like. And there are a lot of people I know that <laughs> bought the book and just enjoy reading about the uh, nature of that life in a somewhat nostalgic way. And so uh, it really was for a broad audience, but primarily because uh, I guess as I've had people tell me, there's no other way you could promote the feel of sustainable agriculture stronger than actually carrying it through a story of a person's life. Well, this will be the final question, but I'm curious to know what your vision is for how science now and in the future can support a more ecological food system instead of an increasingly industrial one. I mean, I think we tend to think of science as it relates to agriculture. We might think of uh, CRISPR. We might think of GMO. We might think of, you know, a whole host of new te technological products that farmers can use to make their lives quote unquote easier. But there's just as much scientific insight and, and discovery when it relates to ecosystems and producing food. So again, to kind of restate the question, you know, how can science assist and support an ecological food system instead of one that's, you know, destructive and, and eroding rural communities? Well, I actually discussed that in some philosophical ways in the book itself. And I, I think that's a very important question. You know, we, we have, I'm, I'm a believer in the value of breakthroughs in science. As you mentioned, uh, genetic engineering, modification of organisms and so forth. But I think what we have to do is use that, those breakthroughs and that knowledge in a way that we build it into a more healthier system rather than an intervention to save, uh, to, to solve a problem. Like for example, I address the issue of BT cotton and BT corn and, and so forth in the book by having a concern for that. Rather than these are powerful tools that can be of value in helping to solve the problem and promote things like pest management and other ways in an ecologically sound way. But we have to be sure that we use it in the right way. For example, if we nature and using BT cotton, for an example, if you use it, the BT cotton as it's been produced is the gene that produces the toxin that prevents the feeding of the pest is produced all time in every plant all day long. And we know that these type of things in nature is what is is produced only in response to a problem. It, it's expressed on an as-needed basis rather than being 
produced all time. And it's a principle that's in um, a nature that's called density dependent. So you, we need to copy nature, listen to nature, and use it in a way that's not promoting things like resistance and disruptions and so forth it, by, by being target-specific and as need. That's a little complex way of, of describing this, but basically it's to say, if you're going to develop a technology, use it in a way that you've copied nature and it's working with nature. An example of that is we know in the, that a lot of wonderful tools are developing in medicine, like uh, treatment for cancer and so forth, is leveraging the natural built-in system. They're using the technology to leverage the na natural built-in system of natural defense systems rather than directly attacking the disease itself uh, with a heavy chemotherapy. This is the same thing we need to do in agriculture. Use our tools, listen to nature, copy nature, and leverage the natural system and promote it in a non-disruptive way that works with the power of nature rather than just an interventionist to treat for a pest or fertility problem or other kinds of things. Uh, it's what we call uh, in the book T2 technology versus T1. I hope that was clear. <laughs> no, absolutely. Well, Joe, thank, thanks so much for joining us today. I really appreciate your time. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed it. And it's been a pleasure to uh, work with you and the others in uh, developing uh, uh, the printing and the publishing of this book and getting the word out. It's been a joy. And I do, I guess, along the line of, that you were just pointing out near the end. Uh, we're all in this together and we need to advocate for a, uh, a better future of working with nature than to lose our connection with it. We are part of it is uh, a state in one of the first pages of the book, uh, uh, quoting Rachel Carson, nothing exists alone in nature. We are part of it and we need to work with it. Well said. Thank you so much, Joe. It's been my joy. There you have it. Go buy a new farm language at the AcresUSA.com bookstore. Use the coupon code AUGUSTPOD, that's A-U-G-U-S-T-P-O-D, for 10% off on all titles. Acres USA is the premier North American publisher on production scale, organic, and sustainable farming. For over five decades, we've helped farmers, ranchers, and market gardeners grow food organically, sustainably, and without harmful toxic chemistry. Thank you for listening to another episode of Tractor Time brought to you by Acres USA and Barn to Door. Subscribe to our channel on YouTube, iTunes, or anywhere podcasts are available. Also find us on AcresUSA.com, EcoFarmingDaily.com, and don't forget to subscribe to our monthly magazine. Thanks again for listening and have a great week.